And as you see, I've entitled this message, <clears throat> Following the Two Clouds. Somebody may say, what? Two clouds? I thought there was one. Really, there were two. And I always find that a little bit interesting because there are two witnesses at the end time. And definitely the two clouds that we'll be taking a, a look at today in the second message were witnesses as well to the Israelites. You know, the spring holiday season is a time of personal reflection, meditation. We've talked about that a great deal, as well as personal dedication. And as I said earlier, there's a difference between dedication and devotion. Devotion is, yes, a feeling and an emotion, but dedication is a determination. Being determined sometimes means we can oftentimes look past emotions and, and, and it will see us through when emotions will not carry us all the way. And we are to be dedicated to the Father and Jesus Christ. We call ourselves Christians, Christ-like disciples of Christ, not mere followers, but disciples that are able to eventually be able to be used to teach others as we learn. I ask the question, are we going to do anything different in our daily walk with God and our daily interaction with other people that we come in contact with each day this year? Are we going to be a little more palatable as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Or are we going to be rigid, hard, and turn people away? Are we going to do our due diligence and personal study and keeping ourselves in the ways of life, as Jude says? Understanding that at the end of the day, we are responsible for ourselves. We have accountabilities. We have the, the need to interact, we have the need to set the right examples, but understand something, that while we plant seeds, we don't make the growth. And as a part of that, that requires us to be deeper in our commitment to living as sinless a life as we possibly can every day. You know, from an Old Testament perspective with Passover, as I mentioned, Passover night, it was a memorial of God passing over the houses for which the children of Israel were in. And as a result of that, being under that blood on the doorpost, they were protected from the killing of the firstborn of all that were not under that blood. The Christian Passover is not necessarily all about the memorial of Israel's exodus from Egypt as much as it is a memorial for the death of Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, we do that until his return and we acknowledge him as the bread of life. We acknowledge him as being under that blood and entering into that blood relationship as family. And when we think about that, when we think about what he endured, you can say a cross, a stake, whatever, a tree, whatever you prefer, because all three of them are there in Scripture. And he shed a lot of blood, and it was on, not only on our behalf, but on the behalf of all mankind. But in their right time and in their right order. And it's not up for us to determine that order. What is understand is uh, what we should understand is that now is our time. And we don't need to miss that opportunity. I find it interesting that right before the Passover, on two different situations, or occasions, I should say, Christ cleaned out the temple. He cleaned out the merchandisers that were making his house a, a den of robbers and not necessarily a house of prayer. Had to do it twice, the beginning of his ministry and at the end of his ministry or right before the end of his ministry. How many times do we need to be cleansed on a daily basis? We think about the night to be much observed, referenced last night it being a night of vigil, a night for which there's the expectation of freedom and deliverance, but there's also the expectation of watching, watching around us, and they had to watch themselves and they had to be careful in the world they were exiting. You and I have to be careful 
in the world we're exiting and be watching ourselves. You know, when we think about Jesus Christ's resurrection associated with the wave sheep offering being done, you know, we, we put a lot of hope and faith and confidence in our belief. Just as God delivered Israel from the clutches of Egypt's fist of control, God is telling us spiritually that Satan's whole system, whether you call it Egypt or whether you call it Babylon, because it's called in both places. We are given a power for God to work to release us from that power and that power of Satan. But we have to be vigilant not to go back to that way of life. The Israelites, they wanted to go back to the flesh pots. They wanted to go back to what was an easier life, they thought. And they were willing to sell their freedom for that. Or at least some were, put it that way. Each time I think about the story and the example, that should be something that resonates strong with you and strong with me about human nature. And each one of us still have elements of that. Hence the reason why what we watch is ourselves so that we don't allow the flesh to overtake. And as a result of that, lead us in a wrong direction. It requires we guard, we protect, because we have an adversary who would love nothing more for us to abort the process. You know, we, we have a lot of discussion in the world around us and our nation about abortion, and that's a physical thing. God is a God of life, but spiritually speaking, you know, it can, it can result in our abortion and the abortion of our being born in the family of God. And the introduction of either chemicals or the introduction of some very decisive instruments that can kill, Satan spiritually has the same thing when you think about it. Wrong ideas as well as tools to make us fall and then the desire to want to go back. I think that's why it's so in interesting to me that there are the clouds that are mentioned and the following of those clouds. We read earlier in Exodus 12, 17, I won't go back and ask you to turn there, but we're told there, so you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread for on the same day that I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting or perpetual ordinance. But I would ask you to turn over to Exodus chapter 13. There's another aspect of these days that I think is important. You know, I referenced Herod wanting a sign. And yet, Jesus said that he would give no other sign other than no, uh, the sign of Jonah being three days and three nights in the belly of the earth and had that conversation with their landlord as well. And uh, it was interesting, you know, I said, well, you know, a lot of Christianity today teaches and they, they only portions of the day. And he was like, but that's not what Christ said. I said, no, you're right. He did not say a portion of each day. He said three days and three nights. And it is interesting because that's a sign, but the days of unleavened bread, as we see here in Exodus chapter 13, is a sign as well. Beginning in verse 6, for seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast of the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout your generations, throughout the seven days. So you do it every day throughout the seven days, and nothing leavened shall be seen among you, nor shall any leaven be seen among you in all of your borders. And you shall tell your sons on that day, saying that it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. So if Roland's asking why, well, there's the answer to the why right there. But notice what he says, and it shall serve as a sign to you on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. Unleavened bread is a sign. You take that every day and put that to your lips. That should be a sign. You know, you got the Bill Engel. Well, there's your sign, the comedian. Well, there's your sign. There's my sign. That's why it's important for us to do it every day. And unleavened bread is a sign to us. 
of deliverance from sin and in the law of God, and the law of God is to be in our mouth, ingested into our actions, as he said, as a reminder to your hands, what you do, and in your forehead to your mind to enlighten and navigate your way through life. He goes on to say, for with a powerful hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Therefore, you shall keep the ordinance of this appointed time from year to year. Why do we keep the days of unleavened bread? Because they're a sign of our coming out of the world around us. And certainly a sign of our not going back. The exodus from Egypt, you know, when you think about it, it's one of those foundational reasons for observing the feast today. And just like God delivered ancient Israel, he delivers us from our sins and difficulties on an ongoing basis if we remain faithful and this is an example with the unleavened bread into our lives. But there's another symbol for us to consider, the two clouds. While we're here in Exodus 13, let's look at verse 17. We'll read through verse 22 here. Now then Pharaoh had left, let the people go, and God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near, for God said the people might change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. You know, I, I think about that sometimes when I read that passage because I think sometimes that, you know, God may give us what we need when we need it. We want to know everything all the time, all at once, and yet God will give you, give me what we need when we need it if we rely on him. Sometimes, as Garth Brooks says, God's greatest gift is an unanswered prayer. One that you want a certain thing and God's like, no, I don't think you need that right now. And we are the uh, uh, impetuous, rambunctious teenager that wants it all now. Verse 18, hence God led the people around the way to the wilderness of the Red Sea and the sons of Israel went up in mar martial array from the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here with you. Promise kept from the promise that was made. Verse 20, and then they set out from Succoth and camped in Elam on the edge of the wilderness, and the Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. When you really get down to it, it's two separate clouds together, but their two functioning purposes are different. And he goes on to say in verse 22, and he did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. I think there's a reason for that, too. Let's turn over to Exodus chapter 14, just the next chapter over, verse 19. It's interesting when we look at the, the components. We'll read some scriptures here about these clouds. Verse 19 says, And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went before them and stood behind them. It's interesting, you're talking about an angel of God and the pillars. Two separate things. So it came about that the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of, the Is of Israel, and thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one. Interesting to that, that God can give light to certain individuals and darkness to others. And he can allow Satan to hide and create a, a shield of blindness on people spiritually as well, but God's still in control. It gave light to the other, and so that on the one did not come near the other on that night. Verse 24, and it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud. And he troubled the army of the Egyptians. God literally looked down, God of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ, 
a representation of this pillar of fire now. And he looked down through the cloud, or through the pillar, and he was stirring up, causing problems for the Egyptians, for the good of the Israelites. Now let's turn over to Numbers chapter 9. Numbers chapter 9. Begin in verse 15. When we talk about the strength of God, and we can use the God family in this case, both God of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ, and the Father. It's interesting, I think, that there's this representation of these two clouds as well. One that's fire, and one that is just the pillar of a cloud during the day. Beginning in verse 15, it says, Now on that day that the tabernacle was raised up, the cloud covered the tabernacle and the tent of the testimony from evening until morning. This thing was literally, if we if we kind of get it in your mind, or I have in my mind, it's like a, a tornadic cloud. And it just goes up and moves around in front of them. Kind of, kind of strange when you think about it. It goes on to say, is above the tabernacle, like the appearance of a fire. So it had the ability to change as well. It could be one thing at night and one thing during the day as it was serving and being there to provide for the Israelites. So it was always, and the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Can you imagine? Just stop for a moment. You are an ancient Israelite and you're a kid and all these tents are around the testimony, that the, the tabernacle, and you can just sit there and watch it. That must have been an amazing thing to look at when you think about it. And you saw it get up and move, and you saw it change from day to night and per, still provide what was needed. It had to be an awesome sight when you think about it. Continuing on in the story, it says, And whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, after the children of Israel would journey. And in the place where the cloud settled, there the children of Israel would pitch their tents. It was God giving him in the form of his will in these clouds by day and by night. At the command of the Lord, the children of Israel would journey. And at the command of the Lord, they would camp. As long as... As the, as the cloud stayed above the tabernacle, they remained in camp. Even when the cloud continued long, many days above the tabernacle, the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not journey. I find that just amazing. That is following the instruction of God. Following, when he says move, you move. When he says be still, you be still. So it was when the cloud was above the tabernacle a few days according to the commandment of the Lord that they would return and camp, and according to the command of the Lord, they would journey. So it was when the cloud remained only from even until morning, and when the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they would journey, whether by day or by night. So it didn't necessarily matter. It was whenever God said, move, you moved. And you knew that that was what you should do because you saw it in front of you. Whenever the cloud was taken up, they would journey, whether it was for two days, a month, or a year. It didn't matter how long you just followed that cloud. And everyone saw it, and it was right in front of you, obvious, whether it was day or whether it was night. Goes on to say, and they were above the and it was always with the tabernacle, and the children of Israel would remain encamped and not journey. But when it was taken up, they would journey. And at the command of the Lord, they remained encamped, and at the commandment of the Lord they journeyed, and they kept the charge of the Lord at the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. You kind of get the idea God was in charge, and you kind of get the idea they were obedient. They didn't do their own thing. They didn't decide, well, you know, I think I'm just going to go over here for a little bit. You know, I'm tired of walking. I'm just going to sit here for a while. And we know they murmured the entire way. And we know they complained and griped, yes, but they did follow him. And that's something for you and I to think about ourselves. Let's turn over to Exodus chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40. Verse 
here in verse 34, it says, and then the, the, the cloud covered the meeting or tent of meeting, which is the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. You know, this wasn't just some random happen chance, coincidental thing, some phenomena, natural thing. No, they knew who was in that cloud and they knew where he was and even Moses couldn't go in there because it was so bright. Therefore, all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But the cloud was not taken up. Then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night. And the sight of all the house of Israel, they saw it. It was a sign. And it was an indicator. They knew that they weren't just following Moses, a man. They were following something far more powerful. Something that could change and give them protection from the desert heat. And then give them warmth in the desert night. Something that I don't think you and I can really completely grasp. This cloud of glory hovered over the tabernacle as we see here. And it was in the wilderness, and it was God's dwelling place on earth at that time. He was dwelling with his people. Now, we understand the Apostle Paul uses the analogy of the temple and uses the analogy of you and I, anyone that has God's Holy Spirit, are, are part of the temple and the temple of God. This was the temple of God at the time. And it was not a part of being a stationary aspect of the world around it. It was leading them to what? The promised land. It was leading them to a specific destination. Now we know they traveled for 40 years and we know that as a result of a lot of disobedience, many of them died. And we know as a result of their inability to, tro to tr truly trust him completely, individuals under a certain age were not permitted to go into the promised land. All of these things should be symbols to us. They should be reminders to us. And, you know, you think about it. Again, I go back to that each day you bring unleavened bread to your mouth. It should be a reminder to follow God completely, not even just partially. When we think about it, the Israelites followed. We see here that listed, but it was only partial. It was not in their hearts. They physically did a lot of right things, but they also did physically a lot of wrong things with their mouth that was a part of their heart. Because as we know, words don't come out of your mouth until you have thought about it for a while. There was partial obedience. You and I are to have total and complete obedience. You know, we're told in Hebrews 13, 5 through 6, and I'll read the scripture for you. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do to me. Think about those words in Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. Think about our conversations that we have. And and I'm not, not trying to get all weird with with you when i say this but you know god hears our conversations whether they're in this room another place wherever we're at when jesus says you'll be judged by every idle word that comes out of your mouth our conversations and i don't understand i don't know how i don't know if there's some big recording mechanism i have no idea all i know is that Everything that comes out of our mouth is going to be a part of our judgment of Jesus Christ judging us. And our conversations are not to be with covetousness. And you think about that. Why would the writer of Hebrews associate this with covetousness? Wanting your way first. Wanting what you want first, not what God wants. 
And by trying to contend with God, and then as a result of that, not be content with what he's given you, then we don't trust him. And we don't trust him to the point where we understand that he will never leave us or forsake us. And there's a lesson in that, I think, with the two clouds. A few things for us to consider about these two clouds. The cloud in the day was for shade, it provided shelter from the extreme elements that are in a desert environment. I never walked a desert during the heat. I walked enough of Arizona's Sedona Desert in November to get quite hot. And I was glad when we ended that two hour walk. I didn't want to walk anymore. I can't imagine that life. But, uh, you know, you think about it, this extreme elements and a shelter is given to provide you some, some protection from that. And then, of course, it was a fire by night providing warmth. But in regardless of whether it was giving warmth or giving shelter, it was always giving direction. Stop, go, stay, leave, go in this direction. Don't go in that direction. Go in this direction. Direction was always a part. You really get down to it. The two clouds were a compass leading the way to the promised land. Are we following the clouds today to the family of God, to the kingdom of God, the promised land, spiritually speaking? God was in the clouds. Notice we saw where he looked down through the clouds on the Egyptians. He was in the cloud. God revealed himself to Moses in a burning bush that we know that did not consume in the fire, yet continue. Don't ask me to explain that. I've told you before, I got more questions sometimes than I got answers for things. I have no way of understanding a lot of that. But it's also interesting that when the Israelites went to Mount Sinai, there was a dense cloud and he descended on Mount Sinai to provide the law through, a, through that dense cloud as well at night. And there was what? Fire, there was lightning, there was thunder, all the things that we see that were a part of these two clouds, denseness as well as light. Israel was led by the cloud and the clouds never left Israel. Interesting. And all of their murmuring, bickering, complaining, griping, covetousness, he never left them out there, even though he probably gave them every reason to leave them out there. You and I probably would have left them out there. I'm sick of these people. Look what I do for them. And they continually just want their way, like a bunch of impetuous teenagers. Something for us to think about each day of these days of unleavened bread. You know, it was a, it was a form of testing. We know for the 40 years that they wandered throughout the desert and some of that they brought on themselves. You know, if they hadn't have been so impetuous, if they hadn't have run their mouth so much, if their hearts had not been so evil and they desired to go back into the slavery that God had given them freedom from, do you think it would have taken 40 years? We don't know for sure, but I kind of doubt it. They took the long way because they wanted their way, not God's way. Something for us to think about. We think about Jesus Christ being in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, being tested by Satan. But in that test, he proved his loyalty to God. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. No matter how long our journeying may be, individually, the church collectively, before Jesus Christ returns, you know, I guess the question is, are we proving during these times where our loyalty lies. Is our loyalty being tested often? I would submit to you and to myself, it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. Of course, the manna came down from God. And all drank the same spiritual drink. 
They drink from a rock. Explain that. I have no explanation. I've heard of water being inside cactuses. I've seen water inside of plants. I hadn't seen water come out of a rock yet. They did. And they followed that rock, which was Christ. Who was looking down in that cloud? Who was in that cloud? Who was in that cloud when it landed over the tabernacle of tent of meeting? Christ. According to the Apostle Paul, if we're to believe what we're reading. I have a couple of things here as I, as I go through this to, to kind of wrap this up. The purposes of these two pillars of cloud. One, they were God's compass. It showed the Israelites where God wanted them to go and what God's will was for them. We think about David. He wrote in the book of Psalms and he draws a lot of inspiration of the path being lit and the path of the light of, of God. And as, as spirit begotten Christians, our compass is to be the Father and to be Christ, the Holy Spirit and the Bible. And each one of those or in many regards, a part of what this, these two clouds are, giving us shelter and giving us warmth, warmth in a close relationship through some very treacherous times in our own lives. Shelter sometimes from extremities going on around us that we don't like, but it could be a lot worse. Rotator cuff surgery doesn't feel good, but it's better than not having an arm. Just a lot of things for us to think about. Those pillars of cloud were God's instructions. The Israelites learned to discern God's will, given instruction through the movement of the cloud, of fire and the cloud of the, of the pillar of cloud during the day. Moses and Aaron were the priests, and Samuel, as we know as well, would be calling upon their name later. And, and, and it's interesting that they called upon the Lord, and he answered, and he spoke to them in the pillarly cloud in a cloudy pillar. That's from Psalms 99 verses 6 through 7. And it's interesting that it also references the testimony of the Lord. And as Christians, we receive instruction from the Word of God. The Holy Spirit helps to lead us, the Comforter, the Helper, to lead and guide and direct us, bring things to our minds when we need them brought to our minds. And it's interesting, in John 14, 26, we read it on Passover evening, but the Comforter, even the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, it shall teach all things to you and bring it to your remembrance that I have said unto you. Number three, the two clouds were protection mechanisms. As I said before, shelter. Isaiah chapter four, verses five through six. This is from the Revised Standard regarding the shedding of light. Then the Lord will create over the whole site of Mount Zion. Notice this Mount Zion. And over her assemblies, a cloud by day and smoke and shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory, there will be a canopy and a pavilion or defense. And it will be a shade by day from the heat and for a refuge of a shelter from the storms and the rain. You ever thought about clouds actually stopping rain from coming? That's what's referenced in Isaiah, and that's a futuristic viewpoint, by the way, because that's prophecy. He's using the metaphor of what happened in Israel to talk about what will happen with the church. It's interesting that, that it's a canopy reference there, and that that does provide protection. Perhaps the lesson for us as Christians today in this world is that God's wisdom will lead us where he wants us to go, and will help keep us faithful if we have a resolute trust in him. You know, we, we reference security, protection. All of these things are things associated with a canopy and associated with these two clouds. It's a visual reminder, these two clouds, of reverence to God when we think about it. We read through all those scriptures and how it was God's will. And they were following God's will, and it was visibly in front of them at all times. It's a sign of God's power. Not only were the two pillars a witness to the Israelites, but they're also witnesses to the surrounding nations that God was leading them. And giving them wisdom and direction all along the way. You know, I find it interesting in closing, the pillar 
was no longer required after Israel settled in Canaan. It didn't happen anymore. I find it interesting that manna stopped when they got into the promised land as well, providing that spiritual food. Perhaps the cloud of fire and the cloud by day had completed their purpose at that time. Because you think about it, when the Israelites in Joshua 3, verses 3 through 4, crossed the Jordan River, it was all about the Ark of the Covenant at that point and following that across. Giving us uh, the 2,000 cubits of length before they could even go across the river. But once they entered that river, it was all about following the, the Ark at that point. All of these things, I think, are important for us. Things for us to consider in this very unique symbol that's given and it's associated with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The question is, are we able to connect the dots? Perhaps in the future, as the kingdom of priests, we may experience what's oftentimes been referenced as the Shechem of glory that was upon the Ark of the Covenant, if we'll follow the two clouds during our time of journeying now, leaving sin so that we can arrive at the promised land.